Welcome to Publishing Python Packages to PyPI. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. Nothing like starting out with rhyming couplets, huh? In this course, you will learn about Python packages, packaging, and virtual environments, how a Python package is structured, what a build system is, how build systems use PyProject TOML files, the build and twine tools for building and uploading packages, as well as a couple of alternate build systems. This course was tested using Python 3.11.1, pip 23.0.1, build 0.10.0, and twine 4.0.2. The Python packaging world is constantly changing. The companion article for this course was given an update eight months prior to the course, and things had changed even in that short time. The version of pip in particular is important. Earlier versions will mean less capabilities with the PyProject TOML files that you'll be seeing throughout this course. As my comment in the previous slide kind of foreshadowed, packaging in Python is, well, complicated. And, well, changing. Python enhancement proposals are still being written and argued about that impact how packaging works and the different tools in the packaging ecosystem. Not that long ago, one of those PEPs defined the PyProject TOML file, a text-based configuration file that is intended to supplant the other project metadata mechanisms. The two most common tools for building and publishing Python packages are Build and Twine, respectively. This course will show you how to use them and then briefly cover some alternatives. Before digging into a specific package, the next lesson does a quick overview of what a package is and how it relates to virtual environments. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll be showing you what a Python package is, how it fits into your coding landscape, and what all that has to do with virtual environments. All the complexity I've been referring to comes about because of Python's age. It actually predates the web and was originally a local scripting solution. There wasn't much thought about shipping anything except maybe the scripts themselves, and packages really weren't a consideration. It wasn't until almost 10 years into its existence that Python started thinking about package support, and thus Disutils was born. Three years later, the Python cheese shop was created. Python the language is named after Monty Python the comedy troupe, not the slithering apple tempting things. The cheese shop is a famous Monty Python sketch, so when it came time to think about a site, it got named for the sketch. In fact, the original URL still exists and redirects to PyPI. Not only was it named in a funny way, but it didn't do much either. The original PyPI was only a listing of the existing packages out there. As package management advanced and multiple versions of Python and libraries started kicking around the same machine, a problem occurred library, and version conflicts. Thus was born virtual environments. I'll come back to that in a bit. And like all history, it continues to be made. For those who listen to the Real Python podcast, you'll have heard Mr. Bailey and I discuss this several times. Things in the packaging world are adapting quickly. I suspect I'll be having to update this course in a short period of time. All right, let's get some terminology out of the way. And like all terminology, there's the right way, and there's the way everybody uses it. A script is more or less agreed upon. That's a single file. A module, technically, is a single Python file that can be imported, but colloquially, most developers tend to mean the directory the file is in and encapsulates, the thing being imported. A package is a collection of modules, but again, the real use of this differs a little bit. Typically, you'll hear module to mean the code that is installed and being imported, while package typically gets used to mean the thing you're downloading and installing, resulting in one or more of those modules that can be used. And with all this kind of vocabulary stuff, if you look on the internet, you'll see arguments about who is using it correctly or not. I could care less, but it would take a lot of effort. And why is this stuff so confusing? Well, take the following example that doesn't help. The dash M argument to the Python interpreter lets you directly execute some code. This particular snippet is a handy little tool that pretty prints a JSON file. You might think, hey, dash M must mean module, and you'd kind of be right. 
But what dash M is actually doing is looking for a file called Dunder main inside the JSON tool package. It then executes that file. So technically dash M is referencing the package. Dash M, M for package. Yeah. Anyhow, don't worry about it. Just understand that depending on who you're talking to, they may or may not be using the terminology the same way you are. I'm going to stick with the colloquial. It'll be module for the thing you import and package for the structure of the thing you are downloading or attempting to upload. Python uses the sys.path variable to store the list of directories that are searched for importing a module. The REPL session here shows me importing and displaying syspath. There's a lot of stuff in here, most of it being the system library, but tacked on the end is a folder called site packages. When you install a third party package, this is where it gets put. Note that the names of the directories might be different on your machine. This is the structure used on a Mac. The pip tool downloads packages from the PyPI cheese shop and installs them in the very same site packages directory. This is me pip installing the requests library. In fact, funny story, pip itself is a Python module, and so you'll also see it written like this. A lot of articles on the web use this style as it means the only thing that has to be on your executable path is Python itself. It's a little safer. And there's that crazy dash M thing again, this time pointing at the pip module. Anyhow, like I said, either variation on this command does the same thing. It fetches and installs the most excellent requests library. The request library depends on other libraries. Thankfully, pip knows this and installs the others for you. One of those dependencies is the URL lib3 library, and request needs a version between 1.21.1 and 1.27. And that's where the problem arises. What if you need URL lib3 in one of your scripts and it's got to be 1.20 to work? Well, now you have a problem. Enter virtual environments. A virtual environment is a miniature copy of your Python setup inside a dedicated directory. The end result is that it gets its own site packages folder, meaning whatever is installed in one environment won't interfere with another environment. If you need the URL lib3 library version 1.20 for one of your project and requests for another, you just give them separate virtual environments. There are several tools out there for creating and managing these environments. This course doesn't get into them in details. I mention them as they come about because of the nature of packages and their dependencies. To save some disk space, the virtual environment isn't a complete copy of Python, but links to the important bits. The added benefit of this is if you go and install an update, say from Python 3.11.1 to Python 3.11.2, you don't have to recreate your 3.11 virtual environments. They all just point to the 3.11 interpreter and get the upgrade for free. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to create an installable package and upload it to PyPI. As always, should you be caught, the secretary will disavow any knowledge of your actions. We can't afford the music rights, so bum bum ba da da 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 do do do. All right, enough dated TV show references. Yep, I'm old. It was a TV show first. Sorry, Tom Cruise. Next up, what does a package actually look like? In the previous lesson, I covered a brief history of how the Python world got to its current packaging state how that relates to virtual environments, and made bad movie music with my pie hole. In this lesson, I'll show you what is actually in a Python package and promise not to sing. There's an old Carl Sagan quote, to make an apple pie, first you need a universe. I won't go that far out, but you are going to need a package to be able to play with it. In that light, may I present the real Python reader, which I'll be using to demonstrate packaging and packaging tools throughout this course. The project is used in multiple RealPython courses and articles, so you may have seen versions of it before. What it does is read RealPython's RSS feed and shows a summary of the articles on the site. It's available as a PyPI package in both installable and source format, but if you're going to play with it, you're probably better off grabbing the source from the GitHub repo. 
The second link is a quick download of the contents in zip format. Clickable links are in the description below. The reader program connects to the internet over HTTPS. This is the part in the course where I humbly admit I'm not that great at following instructions, and I've learned that I'm not alone in that case. If you are on a Mac and you used python.org to install your Python, you may have done the same thing as me, which is miss the final separate step of installation. That would mean your Python is absent some important certificates and won't be able to connect via HTTPS, and you can't use this program. If you're in the same situation as I am, I'll walk you through it. If you're not, you can skip to this timestamp and miss all the fun. This is a screenshot of the Python installer on macOS. Note the print at the bottom here that says there's a final step after the install needed to get the appropriate SSL certificates on your machine. And this is the final page of the GUI installer. It also tells you where to find the script which installs the SSL. Unfortunately, it's after the big bold congratulations, which is about where I stopped reading. What this page is talking about is a script inside of the Python folder in your applications directory. If you go off to Finder, you'll see this, and that's the script you need to run. Double click it, and it will update the certificates inside of your Python instance, and you'll be good to go. Skip this step like I did, and you'll get a crash or a warning error depending on what version of the reader you've downloaded. This isn't specific to this course. This is making sure you've got your certificates working in Python generally. So anytime you went to use SSL, you would need to do this step. Hopefully, you follow instructions better than I do. That out of the way, let's go on to play with the reader. For those of you who skipped ahead, wow, was that a party and did you miss it? Anyway, I'm here in my terminal and I'm going to use the dash M argument to run the reader module. This is what the reader is supposed to do. Without any additional command line arguments, who doesn't like a good argument, reader shows a listing of real Python articles from the site's RSS feed. I can take any of those numbers on the left-hand side and pass it in as an argument. And the result is the article description, or in this case, the podcast description. Let's look at the content of the package that I've just run. Tree is a third-party tool. It's not installed by default. It just shows the directory listing in a pretty way. Here you can see the complete package listing. The recommended way of storing your code in a package now is to use the source directory. I don't actually like this personally as I've never once written a package that has more than a single module inside of it and so this just means like an extra layer. But if you don't use the source directory, which seems to be the way everyone's doing it now, you sometimes need extra configuration to get the tools working. So editorializing aside, I just suck it up and have gone with the source directory so that I don't have to fight things. Inside that source directory is the actual code module. And because it is a module, it has a dunder init file. And because I want to be able to run it using the dash M, it's got a dunder main file as well. The rest of this is just the code and a config file that the reader uses that does the actual work. Okay, that's the module. How about the packaging stuff? Depending on what version of reader you've downloaded, you may or may not see a setup.py file. The original packaging mechanism used this script to do installation, and some situations still require it. When the reader was written, this file was needed to do an editable install. As of this recording, that's not necessary anymore. If all that sounded like gibberish, don't worry, I'll come back and explain it later. Short version, this file isn't needed anymore and may or may not be in your package. As setup.py started to go out of fashion, it was replaced with setup.config. Again, depending on what version of Reader you've got and where you got it, this file may not be there. The intent behind setup.config was to replace setup.py in most situations, meaning you could do an install without requiring an executable script to run, which is much safer. And finally, this is where the course is going to be focused. The most recent incarnation of the Python packaging world is pyproject.toml instead of, or in addition to, setup.config. This file describes the meta information about the package and all the modern packaging tools use it to know how to build and publish the package. 
The rest of this stuff is more packaging info, like some documentation and the license. I'll cover the rest of these files in detail later in the course. Okay, so that's what a package looks like. By default, when you pip install something, it's going to try to fetch that something from PyPI. If you want to publish something yourself, that means you need a PyPI account. You can get one by going to the registration URL and filling in the account creation form. You will also have to promise, I am not a robot, but I'm okay if you are. I don't judge. With an account in place, you're going to need to pick a name for your package. The package name and module don't have to match, but quite frankly, it's better if they do. It's less confusing to your users. The problem is, package names have to be unique across PyPI so you may find it challenging to come up with a name that hasn't been used before. A common solution to this is to apply a prefix to the module name, like sticking real Python in front of reader, for example. PyPI has a sister site called TestPyPI, which runs the same code but isn't used to install packages. This means you can publish and play around in there to your heart's content without corrupting the main listing. TestPyPI needs a separate account, but the registration process is the same. When you're using the various publishing tools, you can specify on the command line which repo you're publishing to, allowing you to create as many versions as you like in TestPyPI, and then publishing to the real place when you're ready. RealPython Reader is actually on PyPI, so the name is taken, which means if you want to follow along completely through to publishing, you're going to need to go to TestPyPI, and you're also going to need to pick a different package name. When you get there, I'll warn you just before that step. You've seen the development directory of the reader package, but what actually gets uploaded? Well, it's based on that source directory, and it typically contains two things, a wheel and a source distribution. The wheel is named after a cheese wheel, heaven's perfect gift. Yep, those folks at the package authority picked a theme and they stuck with it. No worries, it's all Gouda. Hey, I promised no singing. I didn't promise to avoid bad cheese buns. If you've been around Python for a bit, you might remember the egg file that came out of disutils. That's been replaced by the wheel. The wheel format includes the ability to package pre-compiled platform-specific binaries. The details of that's beyond the scope of this course, but the short version is the wheel is actually a superior package. Wheel and source distribution packages get created by a build system. And now is mostly done through setup tools but even that is abstracted. You can also build using other build systems. In fact, one of the bits of metadata you put in pyproject.toml is just what build system you want to use. Most of this course concentrates on setup tools, but the lesson before the last will briefly introduce you to a couple others. I mentioned the setup.py file when I was showing you the contents of the package. It's the older way of installing a package and would be run after the package was downloaded. It's actually a Python script, which means installing a package requires running code. This is problematic. What if you want to scan the package before running it, say for safety? This is why the Python packaging world is moving away from setup.py. But it is still found in some situations and is needed for more complex packages, especially those that have C extensions and a compile step. Way back in the overview, I got persnickety about the version of pip you'd use. The ability to do an editable package install with only a pyproject.toml file is a relatively recent addition. Not that long ago, you needed a setup.py shim to do this. Use the latest version of pip and it isn't a problem. A big part of the original setup pie script was a dictionary containing all of the package's metadata information. The setup config file is a text-based version of that same dictionary content, and the pyproject.toml file is a toml equivalent. Most of the build and test tools out there are now using the pyproject.toml file. If you're not doing anything too complex, you will be able to stick with just that. Have I mentioned that this stuff is complicated? Yep. Almost makes me think you need another cheese pun to relieve the tension. No, I won't do that. It'd be monstrous. Huh. And this is what you've been waiting for. The Pi Project Toml file for the reader package. Square brackets like this in Toml denote a section. The build system section indicates what build system to use. 
The requires parameter inside the section specifies the version of setup tools I'll be using and the name of the build system backend. The project section has the metadata for the package, starting with what the package is named and then the current version number. This is a short description of what the package does and the readme attribute points at the readme file inside of the package. The author's dictionary contains the name and email address of the package authors and the license attribute also points to a file, this time the license file. Note the use of a dictionary here. There are a couple of different formats for this attribute. This style is the one that points to the file in the package. Next is the array of classifiers. Classifiers are descriptors for the package. A complete list of them is available at the packaging authority site. The classifiers here state that Reader is MIT licensed and based on Python 3. Some kinds of classifiers indicate the purpose of the package as well. Things like Web Framework gives your users an idea of what is there. These identifiers must be from the standard list. It's done this way so the content can be understood and categorized by machines. The keywords attribute is kind of like the classifiers, but this is freeform. You put whatever words here make sense, and these become terms that are included in the search index for your package. The dependencies array is used to tell the packaging system what other packages your package depends on. I'll dive deeper on this later. For now, just get that it's a list of things reader needs and can include version information about those dependencies as well. When you pip install RealPython Reader, pip will also install the dependencies, the feed parser, HTML2Text, and Tomli libraries. And this last bit that I'm going to talk about is the requires Python attribute that indicates a minimum version of Python needed for the package. All of this is actually only about half the file. I'll cover the rest of the later. The bits here that I've shown you are more than enough to get you publishing, though. Once you've published your package, all that metadata shows up on the package's homepage on PyPI. Here's the full name, the description, this entire chunk is from the readme file, the author info, the license, the Python version requirement, and the classifiers. A little bit of configuration information in your package goes a long way. PyPI takes all this information and displays it for your users and also uses it to make your package show up in the site searches. Now that you've got a package, you can publish it. I'll cover that next.